In the grim darkness of the far future, there is only war. And a lot of weird shit. Roll to seize! Welcome to Roll the Seas. This is episode 46. I'm your host, Jay Jones, and I'm joined by my co-host and Warhammer enthusiast, Andrew Dickinger. That's me? It, wait, it is you, right? Yes. Mm, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, like, I feel- Put your blood in this Petri dish. I'm going to light it on fire. That- it's a very specific test. That's very, very specific. It doesn't it's- always work for most diseases or <laughs> possessions. <laughs> But that one time it does work, I will run out of here I, screaming. I was going to say, I feel like the one time it does work, you're kind of screwed Yeah, I'm kind anyway. of screwed. I don't know why I do this test with everyone. I mean, let's be fair. Not a lot of people opt in for this test, but when they do, I don't know what I'm expecting I'm going to do if something happens. Also, if it was positive, it's literally just you and me here, which yeah. means that you wouldn't be able to do anything about yeah. it. Wait, are you confirming that you're actually a monster? I never said anything of the sort. Okay. All right. There's a 50-50 chance that you're possessed or a monster, but either way should make for fun vox casting. Well, I will say that it's hard to recognize myself anymore because of Wait, what? some major changes <gasps> that have happened. Major changes. Wait a second. Have you gone full robot finally? You look pretty good. No, I mean I no, I mean major changes to the world that is 40k, J. Oh, yes. <laughs> because I mean, I don't know why you say that. It feels like this last month was pretty quiet. Yeah. There wasn't a lot of developments and codexes. No real impact. There wasn't any real big changes to Oh, wait a second. <laughs> The biggest little FAQ ever. My goodness. They call it the big FAQ, but realistically, it's like five pages, but those five pages. Those five pages. Holy crap. Oh, man. Oh, man. It is. I mean, and and it was a a late FAQ as well, because I remember last time we recorded here in the Black Library, we were pretty much expecting that by the time people were listening to it, that the FAQ would have arrived, and it did not. Yeah, and it was very clearly delayed. Maybe not, you know, solely because of the results of Adepticon, but it seems that Adepticon's results were a major influence for why they and delayed it. And there's definitely some rules and point changes in here that would suggest that Adepticon might have pushed a few things over the edge. I gotta say, like, just before we get into this, because we are gonna talk about this FAQ, because yes. there's some crazy stuff. The shit needs to be talked about, people. But... I got to say that I think on the whole, we're pretty happy with everything that went down. I love it. I mean, overall health changes to the game are always good. Mm -hmm. I mean, any way to promote fluffier armies as opposed to spam, (laughs) I I, I promote. I just, I, there's so much variety that people can use and then they just don't use it. And I'm just like, how, how are you not bored playing just the same everything is the same yeah now one thing for sure that this faq does affect is our ability to make nothing but goofy spam lists that's true <laughs> that, that does the, unless the days it's of our troops focus <laughs> unless it's troops our days of a million rough riders are over damn it damn those days were the glory days but let's get into it we're getting a little ahead of ourselves that's true because kind of the first thing that they confirmed with this faq which was they were confirming the beta test rules that they had tested with the the psychic focus and uh the character rule and yes and the change yes so specifically with the psychic focus the changes to smite you know that were we've been at least in our group we've been using i mean i think we even used it at lvo didn't yeah we? oh yeah uh, ever since they rolled it out and it's going to be the same with these other rules as well and and maybe not the same everywhere by the way we're, we're speaking just to kind of our local scene um but typically when these beta test rules are released just like for the original psychic focus and the character rule we were using them the very next day immediately yeah yeah and that's just because i think they did, and we'll talk about some of the changes, because they did change a little bit from the beta test rule to the final rule, but I think these are a pretty good indicator of where Games Workshop is going forward with a lot of these rules, but still give us a great opportunity to test and provide feedback. Well, yeah, and I think it, largely they are, in fact, interested in what the community has to say. Oh, yeah. And it's, and especially what the community does. Yeah. <laughs> especially and I mean, what we actually take. Yeah, because, I mean, it's very clear like with what happened with Adepticon, that people can't be trusted when given <laughs> when given a little bit of rope, they take all the rope. 
And so they need to be real back a little bit. Give some real now, back. Now, here's a really good unit. Wait a second. I mean, don't grab all of them. Don't... You took all the units. They're exactly the same. What are you doing? Yes. We'll, we'll get to that. Man, we keep jumping into that, that one. I mean, it's just like it's it's rebounding, yeah. but it's gone. But it's gone. But so for specifically for the psychic focus, they updated it. Before it was just you got a minus one every time you would smite yes. to address them crazy smiters. Then they realized that some armies got really hurt by this a little bit more than they intended. Some armies like Grey Knights and Thousand Sons yep. took a little bit of a too hard of a bat. And, um, you know, we don't know what's going on in your current scene, but in kind of the competitive scene for both of those armies, they're not considered, you know, the tip top best. That's not to say that they can't win tournaments, but they're not considered kind of like the leaders in, in highest power levels. I think it's easiest to describe them. They're, they're struggling. The, yeah, the armies are bit. struggling. And I love both. I mean, I have Thousand Sons, and I love the concept of Grey Knights. I mean, actually, I have Grey Knights, too. What you am have, I talking about? Have I have Knights. both of those armies. Now, granted, your yours are 5th edition Mine are 5th edition Grey Knights, which were pretty damn good Grey Knights. All us older Grey Knights players know that was... That was the heyday. Yeah. I don't know if it's. I don't think it's ever going to come back, but it was pretty good. <laughs> um, but, I mean, Dread Knights have never been better, so... That's the thing. Yeah, I mean, just the fact that Grand Masters can actually be in Dread Knights is still super red. That was still one of the easiest and coolest changes they did for that army of just oh, like, yeah. why wouldn't the commander want to ride? We need more HQ choices. A battle suit. How about the super battle suit? Makes one? him a greater demon, basically. That's so great. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, basically the new change is instead of doing a minus to every time you cast Smite, it's now just the warp charge value goes up by one, which means you can still get those 11s and 12s if you roll them and do like a super D6 Smite. Or for other armies like that rely maybe on that kind of characteristic like Zench or, or Thousand Sons or Grey Knights, they can still effectively do that smiting without being hindered too much. The reason that this is important is because it's increasing the value, what it takes to cast the smite, but it doesn't reduce that actual casting value, which means it's not easier to deny. And right. that was the problem is that with the the flat minus one, it just became easier and easier to it, deny. It was hitting you on both sides. It was it was harder to get off and it was easier to deny. Yeah. It was just like a little too much. Um, also with this new rule, they actually do call out Brotherhood of Psychers and Brotherhood of Sorcerers as not being affected by this. Yes. So they can still smite all day, which every day at five. They need it. Which they need it. I mean, even even Zench Demons needed this with the nerf that they did to the, the invulnerable saves to horrors and stuff like that. Like... Horrors just didn't smite anymore, and it was kind of weird. Yeah, and I was like, now that they can actually do it again. Well, they got all those. They got all those sweet assault guns in the mail. They yeah, were like, ah, right. oh, well, I guess we can't smite anymore. What are all these? They're they're finger guns. Oh, automatic shoot. weapons in our fingers. <laughs> yeah. which was, I mean, still pretty cool. But uh, and then the character rule that basically same, same thing as the same as rule. it was that you can't uh, you can't target a character uh, unless it's the closest model obviously other characters don't prevent this and uh, it has even if there's a another unit that's closer but not visible you still can't yeah. target the character look guys you rhino scoped you ruined <laughs> it for all of us <laughs> Yeah, what, what, what were you thinking? The fact that rhino scoping is a term that <laughs> required a change to the game. Mechanics. To be fair, very clever. I'll give you a lot of points for that. That's yeah. a pretty clever way to get around that rule. Rhino scoping. Rhino scoping. Good stuff. But now this is where we get into some of the newest changes, and this is where we get into some really exciting stuff. The first one, tactical reserves, oh, which yes. is oh man, holy crap! This is a big game changer this almost feels like what's so exciting about this faq is you know we we talk a lot and we use the term meta on this uh podcast quite a bit and what we mean by that is really kind of the the fluid change and competitive landscape of the competitive game of warhammer 40k yeah, it's the current standing con competitive tactica that yeah, exists that's out there and like kind of like the typical armies you'd see and things like that and with this one change it really and a lot of the other ones we'll talk about this FAQ has really, in my opinion, almost kind of wiped the board of the typical armies and typical winning lists you would see at these competitive tournaments. I mean, not completely, but has changed it enough where I'm like really excited to see what people take to next month's tournament. Okay, so if you don't fully understand the entire ramifications of this, essentially what the tactical reserves change did made it so that you are no longer able to deep strike out of your deployment zone turn one. Well, not deep strike out of your deployment zone. You're not able... Oh, well, I guess yeah. that's... Yeah, I, I'm thinking when you say it, I'm imagining people are like shooting out of their deployment zone like a cannon. No. But yeah, you can't... 
deep strike anywhere that is outside of yeah, your deployment correct. zone. You can't deep strike anywhere that is outside of your deployment zone, turn one, which means that you're no longer getting alpha struck and then warp timed by super blob melee units, turn one, that I didn't even get to move my models yet, and suddenly you're all in my line. And I mean, like, that's just one example, but I mean, it, it, it's so many things. I mean, like, with chaos demons, right? Like, the pink horror bomb isn't coming in and hitting you turn one. The blood letter bomb isn't coming in and hitting you. Eldar, you don't have, wraith, you know, a tactic I used a lot was fire dragons web striking in, or a wraith guard web striking in and shooting you with blasts, or even, you know, having the popular the very popular guardian blob dropping in with its 40 shuriken shots and and shuriken cannons blasting you within 12 inches well, like this cuts out a lot of the deep striking teeth that a lot of armies have access to well and i unfortunately this does potentially alter the uh the tactic mechanics of specific armies like blood angels who fairly largely relied on this sort of on thing. that turn one drop and um, smash in the face but the one thing that this change does that i heavily promote is that the game became uh it came to a point of who wins the infiltrator role it became so important with that infiltrator role because it basically what i'm talking about is that you'd be rolling off with your opponent to see who places your infiltrators first whoever does basically gets to carve out the perfect hole for their reserve for where their guys are going to deep strike in and i apologize for any new listeners who are not familiar with we keep using this term deep strike yeah. what we mean is it's an old seventh edition term it's just a really great way to umbrella the overall use of when a unit comes in nine inches away from an enemy you're striking deep into the enemy the, the and you're just striking deep you're striking so, deep just so deep um, it allows you to essentially uh, bring a unit into the table uh, nine inches away from the enemy, but anywhere on the board, as opposed to deploying in, on your side. Right. It, it gives you a lot of tactical flexibility. Mm -hmm. um, and with this change, now, you know, infiltrators are suddenly no longer as important, including things like Nurgling. And, Which were taken in mass. And Rangers, scouts, scouts. Having so much value, and especially things with, like, stealth suits or ghost kills rangers and nurglings which essentially bypass bypass infiltrators in general because they they were done during the deployment step yeah not after deployment so they could essentially just completely deny an army that's no longer as important and what's interesting about that and why i think that's such a healthy change and we think that's such a healthy change is it's removing more of these dice rolls single dice rolls are deciding whole outcomes of games yes which you know has always been a great thing that that they've been slowly moving towards i mean even with implementing i mean see roll to seize is still part of the game right yes. it's the name of our podcast but um it's seizing the initiative is way less effective in this edition because you have things like Bef you know, once the first round has started, but before, like, you know, how infiltrators work and certain things work in the game, you have ways to mitigate getting hit too hard by somebody seizing on you. And now with changes like this, it affects that even more so. Yes. And I mean, it makes it a, a far more balanced game because it was becoming a game where, like, determining who gets the first turn can essentially decide everything jump in and just smash because somebody. you're like it's a good thing i have these three units that cost like half my army but they basically kill half your army before you even get to move anything and with that gone that essentially allows players a breath where they uh, mm -hmm. get to actually function with their armies it also like i like you said it it's less reliant on a single die roll to decide a game and instead makes p players actually have to plan further their armies and be able to weather a first turn strike, which yep. is, it's just, it's going to make the game a lot healthier in general. Exactly. And it's also going to make turns happen a lot more later in the game rather than the first turn. I think with myself and you as well, like a lot happens in the previous iteration of this game on that first turn without it's, a rule like this. It's Yeah, it's it's really first and second turn is where all the magic happens, and then th the third turn on is kind of just clean up. Yeah. And that's how it was. So now it's spreading that out a lot more, and, and I guess maybe this might affect the Calidus Assassin quite a bit because you used to see the Calidus Assassin very influential on turn one because that's when everything came in and everything. Anyway, we're getting a little off topic with yeah. the Calidus Assassin. I just that popped into my head. But... It's great to see that more impact is going to happen a little bit later in the game and not all just turn one and not all decided on that die roll. Now, there are some armies that have still a lot of tricks in this very first turn, which we'll talk about a little bit later on. But overall, I think this is such a 
positive move for the game, and it's going to be really cool to see how armies adjust. Yeah, well, I mean, I'm I'm personally excited because I will be dipping more into Tau infantry mm -hmm. and not having to worry about a Bloodletter bomb or something just basically, or a Zangar bomb uh, assaulting my entire front line turn one is and a big deal. And screens also are now not so, so necessary. They're almost in uh, they're almost unnecessary because uh, you, you will still have what we call blockers. You'll have units that you'll use to do blocking, but having a first turn front line just of like a casualty of suicide like shitty units. warriors in the front, like sorry men, you're gonna have to take the brunt of that deep strike. Yeah, I mean, like the ha no longer needs suicide units is very good. Excuse me, sir, why are we standing out here in the cold? Well, uh, we believe uh, some terrifying demons with hellforged blades will come out of the warp and kill some of us. And uh, it's better that it's you and it's not better us. that it's you and not us. Sorry about that. <laughs> like, what? <laughs> <laughs> blood letters murdering them. Yes. So um, like I think this is this is gonna be really cool. To I think see it'll how things just, develop. I think it'll also just make the game more interesting. And by the way, if you disagree with us, which is again totally fine, this again, remember these are beta rules. And you can, you know, let uh GW know via Facebook. Um and uh that's what I think is so great about all of this is that we all don't have to agree on this direction. For us, our opinion is it's gonna be great for well, the edition, but it's a uh, fluid game system now. Yeah. Where changes can actually happen and then be rescinded if it's too far and when we get to we'll, when we get to talking about our games from this previous tournament i mean i can tell you right now we'll get to it this faq definitely affected me and my army maybe a little bit oh, quite a bit just a tiny well some ways i did not expect smidgen so like i for example my army relies quite a bit on deep striking my wraith guard bomb which is usually a turn one and, and very effective relies very heavily to be in my opponent's zone. And I leverage rangers to zone out and to drop in my wraith guard. So this, if you want to think about it from a negative standpoint, definitely negatively impacts my current list. But I'm so excited about how much this is going to change the current meta and list build. Like this is, this is, I'm very excited to find a new way to play. I'm just interested. I, I'm personally just largely interested in how this will affect players' tactical decisions and how they affect turn one, because turn one will no longer be the oh fuck turn. Yeah, pretty much. Which it's always been. And basically everybody tight, tighten your butts. Yeah, it's Here it definitely comes. a pucker moment where you're just like, oh, I, I didn't win the roll to go first. Here it comes. And also what we might see too is a lot more in terms of units and things that we didn't see because they were so sensitive to that turn one hit. Things like, I think tanks? We'll see a lot more tanks because I think before even the bigger tanks, you get one good melty unit in there or two good melty units in there and boom, those things are just gone. Well, and I think this is why it's important as well that when the game, as the game evolves to integrate more line of sight block and cover because then this is definitely going to make uh, gun line armies stronger and to mitigate that a little bit, we get some line of sight blocking terrain in there so that essentially an army that, like your army, that requires that turn one functionality because you only have three things on the table doesn't suddenly, like, it's like, ah, I guess we have to sit for an extra turn. Well, let's hold on and hope the army's still alive when we get in, boys. Yeah. But yeah, we'll, we'll see. And yes, terrain is a great point that'll help balance that out. So moving on to the next one, um, which we don't have to talk about as too long because I think it's just kind of a, a pretty straightforward change, is it's called Battle Brothers. Yes. Where essentially what that means is you, uh, you quite literally can no longer take what is commonly referred to as soup, which means in the same detachment, now we don't mean the same army, same right? Detachment. The same detachment. Armies are made up of multiple detachments in match play to a maximum of three. Um, but in a detachment, you can no longer take this kind of mixed factioning where if they share, they have to share a keyword that's more than just, I believe it's- Well, a faction keyword that's more than the core five. Which is Chaos, Imperium, Eldari, Yanari and Tyranid. So it was interesting to see the Yanari sneak in there, but that's also, of course, because how the Yanari keyword works is you just kind of call them Yanari and they just get that keyword. Yeah, well, and interestingly enough, the Yanari did not get nerfed as hard as we thought they would. But in general, this means that still certain things like assassins and 
uh, inquisitors and stuff sit in a strange place, which will have to be FAQ'd in some regard. Well, they, they FAQ'd some of the, the units, and I believe they're going to update others, or they already did in their specific FAQs, where they, they said, like, these guys get extra faction keywords so that they, they can be actually But yeah, taken. this means that you essentially can't have, like, a, a single detachment that's a bunch of space marines with a bunch of Imperial Guard with some randomly sisters and or Celestine, Celestine or something. Well, really, let's just say it's probably Celestine, Celestine in that's there. sneaking in there, which I think is great. I, yeah, it doesn't prevent your army fluff-wise from having Space Marines fighting alongside Imperial Guard, which makes total sense. It just means that you actually have to have detachments dedicated to those factions, yeah, which I and, think is good. And how it impacts what we've seen as like winning lists, for example, like for Yanari, for example, um, we saw that some of the winning lists out there, uh, commonly referred to as the Cat Lady list, or the winning list of LVO of the Las Vegas Open, um, in that specific list, there was an Inari detachment that had a mix of Drukari and Eldari, or Craft Worlds, I guess you could say. But yes. now with this new ruling, you can really only have one. So you can have Yanari that are Craft World or Yanari that are Drakari in the same detachment because Drakari and Craft World Eldar, they don't share any faction keyword other than Eldari. That's right. So that is a very interesting thing as well. So it does help mitigate some of that Yanari, you know, power that was out there, which, you know, it might not have been everywhere, but it was definitely in a lot of competitive scenes and causing some challenges. Now, one thing before we move on from Battle Brothers, completely missed this in Tactical Reserves. Forgot to mention this. Um, one, uh, Gene Stiller Colt isn't affected by Tactical Reserves, which is good. Uh, they needed that. They acknowledged that they were just going to get that, screwed in their only ability, that your unique ability they that have. That having Strike from the Shadows suddenly no longer work is a problem. Sorry, Gene Stiller Colt. You got to sneak out of pipes on the other side of the field. <laughs> um, but the other cool thing to recognize is part of Tactical Reserves is you can also only reserve like less than half of your army's power level. Power level. Instead of just number of units, which some armies like the very popular flying hive tyrant list was getting around by having definitely half like units on the board, but they're 12 points of like spores of and spores. like 90 points of tyrants. That well, 90 the board. power level, you mean, 90 right? power, no, I'm saying like 10 power level spores and on then 90 the board. Hive tyrants off the board. <laughs> yeah. Basically, like, yeah, I've got half my units on the board, but the majority, if not all of my power, is coming in and you can't do anything about it. So that's another cool way that they've. Also mitigated, like, hey, you gotta, you gotta have a little skin in the game. You gotta have a little stuff on the board. Well, and I, I, th I think now why this is important because this means that you're still able to reserve more than half your units if you have a single thing on the board that's like very high power level. Like, if you have a single like forty power level unit, it doesn't mean that you can't like reserve any of your other stuff because you only have a few other things. So that allows. It, it, this essentially grants you more tactical flexibility, but reels in the cheese. Okay. Yeah, which I think is pretty good. It's always good. Now, moving on to some very quick, but very exciting interim balance changes, which are pretty cool. Uh, battalions and brigades got better. Uh, yeah, the CP change to battalions and brigades is huge. It's awesome. Oh my god, really I awesome. Three battalions. Well, formally in my previous you list. You will no longer have I will no have. longer because I cannot fit them all in. But um, that's, a, that's a story for a little bit later. But, uh, I mean, two battalions still gets you with the added three that you get to start 13 CPs. That's yeah. crazy. Uh, it's this, uh, especially with the Battle Brothers change, then having reduced detachments is not nearly as bad as it was anymore. And I'm telling you, like this for, for a now a Tau player... This is huge because having three detachments with Tau, if you're not running all infantry, is very hard because their stuff is very expensive. Mm -hmm. And once you go above two detachments, you're like, I don't know if I can fit anything else in. And the army I just played in the last tournament only had six CP because I literally had no room to fit everything. But now. But now, I mean, it's very easy for me to get 13 CP with two battalions, and I think that's awesome. It's so good. And it also, again, incentivizes playing more of that classic, you know, the the classic fifth and, you know, I believe it was fifth was the last one that had the, uh, what was it? the uh, Combined arms detachment. Combined arms detachment, the CAD. Um, and that's always been a great way to balance the game, more troops and, and HQ and less of the the spammy stuff. It also makes a brigade way more interesting. Oh, yeah. Oh, my God. It's Start with 15 CP with just one brigade? You can just have one brigade. Like, 15, set. if you've never had that much CP before, like, oof. That's you. Uh, you are just 
using powers every It's turn. very timely right now. It's like wielding the Infinity Gauntlet you know of CPs. Actually, I didn't realize this. You know what's interesting about this change? I say it's timely because at this day and age, uh, we actually found and recently recovered the Infinity Gauntlet. It's here in the that's Black right, Library. Right, yes. I don't know why I said it was timely. Surprisingly, like not super powered comparatively to the other stuff that we see around yeah here, i know i guess i don't know why i called it out it's it's kind of weak sauce lame. compared to everything else in here lame not like that batman spirit stone am i right <laughs> anyways um i was saying it's interesting that what this battalion and brigade change does with regards to cp is this allows players to essentially be using more stratagems which makes it actually a counter to dark eldar to drakari and more difficult for drakari players to use the vex stratagem the agents of vex because this means that you know, they could be using upwards of four stratagems a turn, every turn. And that makes the Agents of Vex stratagem way harder to use. It also means that they can use their they Vex can stratagem use it more, more often. Like, all right. So back to the FAQ. So a new exciting thing. I mean, not very exciting. I think it's just some balanced stuff. We can talk about some of these pretty quickly. Um, Tide of Traders got balanced a little Once bit. Once per game, thank fucking God. I mean, look, oh. and I and I understand if you used it a lot and it was very intrinsic to your army, it's just, it's a very powerful stratagem. I'm, it's just really powerful. I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna take a stance. I don't normally take oh, hard, wow. he's, hard he's, stances. He's pulling out the soapbox. Uh, I mean, don't stand on it too long. We know that it's cursed. That that stratagem is, it's just cruel. It's it's, it's a do, a do just You can kill, cripple someone's spirit with that stratagem. To kill a 38 of 40 cultists and then to have them use 2 CP and make them immune to morale and then to use 2 CP. And guess what? They're back up to 40. Is It just it breaks your fucking heart. Like, I, will, I will say that they, with a lot of these like interim changes, were very much like, this is winning too much. Slam. This is winning too <laughs> yeah. much. Slam. We'll get to some of these. Really, we should call this, this is more like, this is the nerf bat section. Th this is what I was telling you, Jay. This, the carpet underneath these things is, it's got a ripcord tied to it, and it's just on permanent pole. They were just like, they were like winding up. They're like, cannot wait to swing this, baby. The guy and pulled the lever on the winch, and it has not let up. <laughs> it's just... So if we started this off with saying battalions and brigades got better, which is a positive, here we go. Tide of Traders took a hit. Next up, guess what, Vrain? Word of the Phoenix, smack to the face. Yeah. Um, the power level on that, sorry, the warp charge value got kicked up to eight, yes. as opposed to, I believe it was like six before. Even if and it was she already seven. Cast she has easier. a plus one. Like, that was definitely necessary. Word of the Phoenix, like, I'm sorry, Soul Burst is... Very, very powerful. Yes. Anything that can curb that power before they finally get a codex. And that's... I love Eldar, and I love the fluff of Yanari, but that ability makes people upset, and it's very <laughs> a little too powerful. Strong. A little too strong. My God. Next is we've got abilities that ignore wounds, which I think this is good they clarified that, like, hey, if you got 50 of these disgustingly resilient and, uh, you know, Warlord six up, you ignore just, pains. It just means that instead of having to write this in every codex, that they just make a universal rule. If there are multiple things that ignore wounds, you just can only use one. It's, like, it's, it's, a pretty, it's a pretty good rule. It's once again reinforcing the rule of one that people should understand in the game, that it's spirit of the game-wise, it's rule of one. If you can do it once, then you can't do it again. Now, before we get to this very last interim change, there's one that's actually in a specific FAQ, which, by the way, we're not going to cover all the FAQ stuff because yeah. all of the different Too much. codexes got their own little FAQs, um, some big ones, some small ones. One big one that I do want to highlight, kind of we're rolling through with our uh, with our GW Nerf Bat to a very popular list that was showing up a lot in competitive play is Poxwalkers. You mean and, Poxwalker spam? Yeah. And if anybody doesn't know Call about it this... Proper is where they would use this stratagem where essentially if any unit died near a poxwalker unit they would just grow exponentially to the point where like a fungus they would take over the board very i mean look I very, mean, it sounds very nurgly very nurgly very <laughs> fluffy but my goodness would it, it gets get out, out of hand, hand real 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 quick especially with cool. chaos who can get access to cultists and are just yeah. having tons of bodies already making tons more poxwalkers than regenerating those cultists you can see the combos coming out of this very... You mean you mean something to do with Tide of Traitors and losing almost all of a unit and making them into Poxwalkers. And, and then, then getting just, that entire unit back. And then just getting it all back. It sounds like it could lead to a problem and almost a winning list at a very popular tournament. Good job, Nick Nadavati. Very creative, though, I will say. Um, and awesome. Look, I love people coming up with cool, crazy ways to play the game. Um, but they have said now that if the Poxwalker unit goes above its starting value 
that you must pay for those additional points of yep. those pox walkers, which means they are reinforcement points. They're they are reinforcement points. I think that was a very excellent change because look, it's still really good. Your pox walker unit can get incredibly low. You pop that stratagem. You pop that cloud of flies stratagem, so they can't be targeted. They kill a bunch of your other units, and you get them back almost up to full strength. It's still pretty darn good. Yeah, but it's not crazy fungus like broken where it's, you're just spreading across I, the table as i said it's given some of that rope back yeah just a little bit you yeah. got to give some of the rope back pretty good and again we're all kind of taking these changes and even these nerfs from the place and we'll get to my nerfs which i think are are, are on on par justified are justified <laughs> Um, I think these are good for the health of the game. And remember, with all these changes, we don't mean to be like digging in like, ha It's just, remember, I think at the end of the day, these are all going to be much, make things a lot more fun for the game. Yeah, just make the game more fun. Which, oh, yeah. Uh, more fun, less frustrating. We all we all went through 6th and 7th edition. Ooh. It's time for the game to be fun again. Tough times. Now, the very last interim change, which we have hinted at many times and probably have already revealed. If you already don't, you guys probably already you know, know about all these changes. But I, I want to talk about this. Talk because about this. Uh, this is something we actually discussed in internally within our group but this is something that jay and i actually have discussed a lot and we've mentioned it in previous uh episodes of our show is that they started to introduce this limitation on certain units to essentially stem spam abuse for example commanders tau commanders they implemented a rule that met with some immediate salt justifiable because we don't think it was done the right way which was limiting the commanders to one per detachment Probably limiting it to just a zero to three as opposed to a one per detachment is better because if the detachment restriction ever got lifted, the one de per detachment essentially doesn't do anything. It, the, you can just take patrol, 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 and just have tons of commanders. And exactly. Then what, what does that do? Why not implement that rule for everything? Every unit in the game that is not troops or transports has a zero to three limit. That basically stops all spam and makes people actually have to build fun, fluffy armies. And they did it. Yeah. And that's a big deal. This now makes it so that you will never see more of three that's not a trooper transport in the game for any individual unit. There's no more tyrant spam. There's... Fortunately, no more shield captain spam. No more shield captain spam, which I know is is a little, has been a little frustrating for a few people. Yes. Um. And there's also no more the I think the the dreaded what is it the uh, the, the plague tank. What is that thing? Oh, called? there's no more eight plague burst plus crawler. Plague burst crawlers. Which I believe the very first person to spam the plague burst crawlers did it to literally prove this point that there should be yes. a limitation. I that that was the point they wanted I to I think prove. they literally took it to LVO to be like this shouldn't exist. I'm pretty Which, sure hey, there we go. Um I believe Matt Rutt even mentioned in an interview that this is that there should be limitations because eight flyers should not is be allowed. Crazy, yeah. And by the way, if you don't know Matt Rutt, Matt Rutt is the winner of the recent large Adepticon tournament. Congratulations, which, congratulations, Matt. You um, crushed it. Yeah. So then, like this, this rule in general will make it so we'll see so much more variety in the game, which is always good. Yeah. To have variety and finally some different things coming out of the bag, coming out on the tabletop. You don't have to sit there and be like, "Why are there twenty of these things?" My God. Like, listen, I'm I'm also a Tyranid player, and to see an all fly list is heartbreaking because this is the first time in a long time we've had a really balanced codex. And it feels a little bit like, what are you doing? There's so many other things you could be using, like Carnifex is our dream now. It's almost a little no bit like takes them. going back to the like the abusive like old relationship where it's like, no, you are in a good place. Don't go, don't go back to that son of a bitch. He he, he doesn't love you. He doesn't treat you right. But this is okay. This is an intervention to Tyranid players. Yeah, intervention time. Sorry, can't go back to that old abusive boyfriend anymore it's time we no longer need the flyer and spam we don't we don't you can we can take a step out of that box we don't need to be in that box anymore embrace the old one eye he's here for you old one eye is here for you he oh my it. god he will he will take you to dinner and he will pay to dinner or what 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 he'll pay for your dinner is what <laughs> i meant to say but he'll pay to the dinner listen old one eye is confused he got shot in one of his listen eyes. he's a tyranid there's dinner involved you know it's going to be it's there it's gonna be you probably <laughs> but um but listen this is kind of the last of the big interim changes and man is it so exciting to see it happen man just just good times i think the only other time i was this excited about a change was when we found out in the new eighth edition that you couldn't do the crazy allies mixing that you could do before where you would have like Eldar and Tau and like space wolves in the same army. Yeah. And, I, and uh, again, uh, the last thing I want to mention with this is that 
I hope that they rescind the Tau Commander restriction. Because it feels a little silly now that they have this. This is a better restriction. Allow me to take three Tau Commanders in one detachment, and that's all I can take. And that's it. But not have to take three detachments. it's totally fine. It's totally fine. So hopefully they take it back. Now, I know we've been going on for a little bit to talk about the FAQ, but there's been so much exciting stuff to talk about. And I do want to talk about something real quick. Okay, we don't have to go into it point by point, but we should largely say there were a few points adjustments. Yep, probably the big ones are Mr. G-Man got finally hiked up to that old 400 point level. You know, there's a lot of people salt about it. I'm just going to say do a heart to heart comparison of G-Man to any other under 10 wound character in the game. And you can understand why being under 400 he's, points was ridiculous. He's pretty good. And I think this I think this makes a lot of sense. Also, the reserves change really helps Space really Marines. Really helps them a lot. Yeah. That's the one thing, too. Like, a lot of these changes really helps a lot of armies across the board. Remember, this is all for... Ba- it's a big picture. Just a big old balance don't, change. Don't narrow in on the individual changes. Look at the big picture and the overall health. Now... Of course, we've also got Feculent Normals got a little bit of a boost in price, uh, which, they look, they're very good. So, I've only seen them once, but they were very good in the game I played. So did uh, Fire Raptors as a whole. Fire Raptors, which is interesting because the chapter approved, they came down, now they've gone back up. They realized- Fire Raptors, <laughs> like planes, are just, well, just messing all that, over the place. That, you know what you said there? just perfectly illustrates where we are with the game. It's a fluid system. Yeah. Changes are going to go back and forth until it's the most balanced it can be. But now we can talk about- Well, the most important one, which is- Sly Marbo. I mean, that guy was just yeah. dominating the too tables much. too much. He just had to change. And nothing else important. I actually don't know if he went up or down in points. I've just <laughs> realized now. I don't think I've ever seen that character on the table. Maybe maybe he went down. They were like, no, he's taking him. <laughs> Please? 65 points? Does that feel good? But obviously Eldar is fine. They, they came out unscathed. Okay. So listen. I was prepared. Okay? I was mentally no, prepared. No, you thought you were No, prepared. I thought I was prepared. <laughs> I was like, all Let's right. Let's clarify. Things are going to change. It's going to be good. Obviously, Dark Reapers, I get it. They're they, going to go they, up. They got to they gotta go up a little bit. I think the Tempest Launcher probably should have gone up a little bit as well. But that's my own opinion. I also think some good fixes could have been like minimum change to their to their count. Like instead of having a minimum of three, they could be minimum of five. It reduces spam. You know why I'm okay with why the Tempest Launcher didn't get changed? Because you can no longer have more than three units. Well, that's the thing. That's the other thing. Like a lot of things hit Dark Reapers in this. Like you've got essentially the limit on the zero to three. Um, and I mean, a big one is also the reserves change, the reserves change, and also the points change, which is like, oh boy, they went up seven points, which look, I was like, all right, that's a little bit more than I expected, but you know what? Fair. All right. This way, at least this way, at least look, they're 33 points a unit. Now it's T three and a three plus and one wound. I do not want to hear anybody telling me anymore that Reapers are crazy. It's fine. By the way, I only ever took one unit. Yeah. If they have an unmodifiable three plus to hit that's true it's very good they needed their points guys to i'm not them. gonna argue that dark reapers <laughs> are pretty good because they are but look seven points there they are. i understand in it, the, in it the, works i could see that in the future going down or up depending on how the rules change now i was not ready for the for the just the haymaker of punches that came right after that especially for my list which was like farseers 10 points. Okay, well, you know, Farseers are pretty good. Spirit Seers, 20 points. Oh, God. And then it was like Warlock Conclave, 30 points jump. So, like, all those units got lifts. All the Psychers basically got a jump. Even the Warlock. The Warlock went up from 35 to 55. Now, I will say I was unprepared. Yes. And I, I took it to the body pretty hard. A couple to the face. And this these changes pretty much shattered my current list. Like, my current list, I was expecting, like, Maybe 70 points, maybe 80 points in the high end of change. This, like, blasted my list almost 160 points, which, like, with how it was balanced, like, pretty much shattered the darn thing. You so know, you may say that your list was unbalanced. I may have been a little bit unbalanced. Because you had six psychers in it. I had a lot of psychers. Because I had a lot of battalions. I they were battalions. cheap for, you know... Not counting warlocks, multi wound platforms with four plus invul saves. It can be really argued good that they psychic are cheap. powers. Yeah, now I will say. <laughs> As, as the token Eldar player of this show, um, <laughs> that I think this is good. I think this is good overall, especially for the Dark Reapers. Like, I've, I've been tired of hearing about how overpowered Dark Reapers are, and I'm glad they finally got balanced. Um, and also, for the Psychers, it's true. Look, they don't have that many wounds. They are T3, but they've got native four-up invuls. They have, char- well, most of them with character rule. They're, they're like their melee conclave. weapons are very good. Their melee weapons are good. 
and their psychic powers are some of the best in the game. Farseer is 110. That absolutely makes sense. They can deny twice. They can cast twice. They they can reroll one of their psychic powers. The they can reroll one of their denies. Like they're very very good. Um, and spirit seers look they're they're good. They got four wounds. They can do full smite. They have access to runes of battle, which is some of the best psychic powers in the game. A Warlock conclave look. I know that one's tough. It's tough a little bit for me when I was thinking about it. 30-point jump from where they were at their minimum is, is huge to go from a minimum unit cost of 60 to a minimum unit cost of 90. But truly against some armies, like a good Jinx that can be 36 inches away outside of deny range can literally shut down armies and kill some of the strongest units in the game. So yeah. I think it all makes sense. And I will be first to like raise my hand. I'm not the first. I will be one to say... That, like, I'll raise my hand and say, like, I think these are good once, changes for Eldar. Once again, broad spectrum. If you look at Eldar as a whole, they they it could be argued that their psychic pool is the best in the game as a whole. I'm not saying any indivi- they don't have the best individual psychic power. I'm but saying on the whole, I think it's very easily arguable that they have some of the best for sure. Their selection is very strong, and it makes sense to prevent the spam so that they can't do every fucking power and basically neuter an army. And sometimes they don't get off every power, and we'll get to that story very shortly. <laughs> All right, guys, so that's basically the FAQ changes. Um, and overall, I think incredible changes to the game. Um, yeah, I mean, it's the biggest little FAQ ever. Once yeah, again, I know. Five, four or five pages, but big impact. This feels like the real secret chapter approved. <laughs> they were like a little bit like, oh, a couple points changes in chapter approved, and how about big game changes and <laughs> big FAQ? So... Kudos to you, Games Workshop. Love what you guys did. Excited. And looking forward to what's coming next. And now we go to our favorite segment, our Seasons of the Month, where Andrew and I talk about a time in this previous month at the tournament that we went to, that we go every month, in the wonderful game empire in Pasadena here in California, where we uh, screwed up. And maybe you made some mistakes. mistakes. Mistakes were made. And boy, were Often. mistakes made, Andrew. You're going first. Oh, God damn That's it. right. You don't get to honorably give it to yourself. I'm giving it to you. <laughs> That's right. Okay. With less honor. So I'm going to, uh, yeah, okay. I'm going to go will, first. You will honorably. I'm still the one going first. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> Listen, you're going first, sucker. Um, so I was playing Tau for the first time in the tournament scene. I'm playing the new Tau. There's a lot of mixed opinions with regards to that book. Honestly, I'm very happy with it because, well, no, let me let me take it back a notch. I'm happy with most of it because it's become, once again, what I call an unforgiving army. That doesn't mean it's not a balanced book. That doesn't mean it's not good. It means that you have one... It's just not... It's not a, what people often referred to as Tau before. It was like, kind of like point and click. Point and click. It's not the age of the Riptide Wing, which was too much. It was... Everything shoots so too much. all the time, maybe multiple times in a turn. Um, the the army you have one phase really. They're not. You have a few combat units. They're not the best, but you really you have your shooting phase. You have to know how to like a master general orchestrate your shooting phase because if you do not, then the army punishes you, and that's where it should be. A lot of people don't share that opinion, and they think that's a a fault of the army, and I'm like, no, that's just what the style of the army is, is they've held to a specific doctrine that is their fluff, and if that's not your forte, then don't play them. And there are a million other codexes out there that have very different approaches to battle, and you can play them. So now I was playing a list that unfortunately only had 6 CP, and that was largely because I was using uh, a smattering of different units because I haven't used the new units with the new codex, and I kind of just wanted to get a feel for a lot of different things. Yeah, to test it out. Unfortunately, uh, and this didn't change with the big FAQ, and likely they won't get a change until Chapter Proof comes out uh, later in the year, is crisis suits and broadsides are still not in a good place. They yeah. just they cannot function. They are very points inefficient. I would go as far to say that crisis suits may even be upwards of thirty points too expensive. They are really they are really so expensive. Like when you told me their points cost, like for what they do and for it's, how durable they are, it, it's just I don't think it's a good efficiency. Oh, well, I mean, when you come down to it, when it's an army, it's an army and units that shoot, and they don't shoot well and they're expensive, there's something wrong. But they look so cool! And they do look rad, and they're so... Broadsides and Crisis Suits are like the trademark Tau units, yeah. and they just need to be balanced, and Games Workshop, if you're listening, just make everything in a suit 3-plus ballistic skill, please. It would there's be great. so much minus one in the game, 
please. Yeah. I'm tired of my suit shooting at the same efficiency as a guardsman. It's ridiculous. Or oftentimes, thanks to minus ones, like way worse. Like orcs. Like orcs are like, welcome to the party. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I was using a, a smattering of units. I was using uh, commanders. I was using uh, stealth suits. I was using crisis suits. I was using broadsides. Just a whole plethora. Um, I Kaleidoscope. Had, I had a Yavara. And he was like your ringer. I am not a religious man, but the description that my friend said for the Avara, because he tested it before me, which is Jesus wept, yeah. is the best way to describe that unit. A well, now listen, we do, while we're here, we do we do pray to Kegarok, and it's only because the Harlequins make us. I, yeah. I mean, we gotta, it, it, we're in the library. It, it's controlled by Harlequin. Uh, praise Kegarok. Yes, praise Kegarok. I think they're gone. Okay, I think they're. Are they? I, I have yet to I find their listening tell. devices. I, I, can I never, never tell. Know. But either way, my goodness, does that unit a Borkin a Borkin Yavara? And the reason, if you don't, if you're not familiar with it, the reason you take Borkin, which is their version of a, one of the chapters. If you're thinking like chapter tactics for Space Marines, Craft Worlds for Eldar, uh, they have Seps, and their Sept Tenant, as they're called, for Borkin is all rapid fire and heavy weapons ranges are increased by six inches. And it turns out all the weapons on a Navara. Or Yavara, or Yanara. That's not the word. No, no. But all of them are either heavy or rapid fire. They're all heavy, except for the the one set that I constantly forget to use, which is it has a D6 bolter pistol. That's Ooh. like for close range that I How always powerful. forget to use. <laughs> um, it's a D6 shot bolter at six inches pistol. Whew. I, it's save the best for last. Fletch at Dischargers, Jay. Um, but it just uh, violently shits on you. <laughs> No, that's not how the image <laughs> you, that I was trying to... You definitely made the hand motion of, like, violent no, diarrhea like discharge. Explosive panels. Yep, explosive panels. <laughs> but it has it has two weapons, specifically. It has a uh, an EMP discharge cannon mm. and a uh, phased plasma flamer. And these two weapons are both devastating. A lot of people don't give enough credence to the EMP weapon. The EMP weapon is really mean against vehicles. Oh, yeah. But the flamer... Let's talk a little bit about the flamer, Andrew. Oh, man. What's the profile of that flamer when it's uh, giving the old Nova Charge boost? So I'm just going to just tell you what the Nova Charge profile is, because if you're not overcharging it, that means it's got one wound remaining and it can't overcharge. Yeah, exactly. Um, It'll die yeah. flaming you in the face. <laughs> um, the Nova Charge profile for the, oh, well, the, we'll say the EMP gun first. The EMP gun makes it a 3D3 gun, strength 10, AP minus 3 auto three damage a uh, pretty good six is the wound against vehicles are d3 mortal wounds on top of the damage <sighs> very strong yeah um and with the borkin stratagem you can make one of those uh d3 re-rollable well you'd really save it for the second one mm. and the second one is the flamer the flamer is 3d6 hits because it's an auto hit flamer that's a lot of flame strength six AP minus two, auto three damage. My goodness. And of course you take an advanced targeting system on it, which makes it AP minus three, and the main EMP gun AP minus four. Ah. To give you a for instance of how strong this thing can be, went against a list that was eight shield captains, custody shield captains, and three armager, uh, those new- uh, Little mini knights. Little mini knights, which are really cool looking and so yeah. much smaller than I thought they were. Yeah, they are a lot smaller, right? Um, they're very, they're quite considerable. They're, well, to give you, if you've never seen one, they're shorter by significantly than a riptide. Mm -hmm. Like a riptide is a, has a good inch and a half quick. on them. They're moving. Um, and you can take th uh, uh, one to three in a single super heavy. Uh, slot which is really cool um but i was going against this list the yavara alone killed four shield captains and two armatures ouch by itself that's a lot that's half that list that's more than half that list it killed an armager and a shield captain in overwatch oh that should tell you something this it's you it's bad to charge it to charging it with melee you mean charging a 3d6 automatic hitting D3 three damage da flamer? <laughs> Minus three? My goodness. Um, especially when uh, if it ha if it kills whatever is charging it or that thing doesn't make combat with it, then it can overwatch again because of supporting fire. Yeah, it's it's very strong. Oh, geez. It's it's definitely I feel like it's going to be, you know, the the token units mm -hmm. in Tau Armies is going to be a single Yavara that's from the Borkincept. I 
I can understand why. This is why my friend described it as Jesus wept. He yeah. is not a religious person either, but that is the only way to describe that thing. It's so powerful. Very powerful. So, now we're talking about a lot of positives here, Andrew. <sighs> did, this did, did I, off, my friend. Did, did I, did, did, am I diverting too much? You are. Okay. Now the pain must come. <sighs> so, I did fairly well at this tournament. I went two and one. Um, the first two games I won, and then I went against my last game against one of my rivals, a guy named Jason. We are now ultimate arch enemies. We were one, one, and one. We had one win on each other and one tie on each other, and now he's up one win because he's a bastard. And now you must craft ways <laughs> to defeat him. Well, I and kudos to him again. He won with, mm, I believe, majority adeptus mechanicus. Um, yes, he had adept uh, admac. He had in single knight, which mm -hmm. you don't see single knight. You don't very see often. that. And he had some Sororitas, which was, you know, a nice smattering. And yeah. it wasn't soup either. Like, he had individual detachments with these things. Yeah, so he was, did a great job. Great he, player, too. Won the tournament. Good job. Great job, Jason. I, I'll get you next time. <laughs> I'll get you next time. Um, so I was going against this list, and the... Uh, unfortunately, I'm I was not familiar enough with the Tau, especially with using things like the Avara, which has an 18 inch move. It's very quick, and things like Cold Stars, which a 40 inch move, which is just insanity. Um, and I essentially let him box me into a corner. So he came at me with a knight. He had uh, four Honor Gardoon crawlers around Call, which is a popular build. All with the anti-air platform, which against Tau is actually real mean when all my things have fly, basically. Yeah. Um. So he's hitting on twos re-rollable. Not great. Ouch. Um, so he's coming at me with all this stuff, but I realized because of how I deployed behind this ruin that his knight basically came down a corridor at me. And my Yavara and both of my uh, commanders could have just let it come down that throat and bypassed it entirely and gone and just taken out all the honor groups. And just gone for the real meat, the real, uh, the juicy the, bits. The, the heavy back. lifters, because I was essentially investing, and this is largely due to flashbacks from the last tournament of where he one-shot my, my my Swarm Lord with his knight, and we don't need to get into that. Um, <laughs> so yeah, this is the that. same. this is the same villain from it's our last tournament. It's the same month. villain. <laughs> Um, and they got uh, good the, work, Jason. Uh, they they the Imperial Knights got a chapter approved stratagem, which allowed the Knights to. Uh, it's called. Uh, no, that's actually just straight out of Adeptus Mechanicus. No, this is I'm saying specifically that a chapter approved allows them to do. Oh, allows them to do this. Yes. I believe it's called like Rotate Ion Shields. Rotate Ion Shields is a stratagem that allows any knight, essentially, including the Forge World Knights, to use this stratagem, and it makes it so that they add one to their invul saves. Now, for the some of the Forge World Knights, which is one of the ones he was using, the Knight Majira, if that's how you it pronounce has, it. It has... Um... Plus. It has a four plus invul save against shooting. It's spoilers. I can only shoot things, <laughs> and uh, you give it a plus one. And it's a three up invul save, and that's a problem. That's pretty good, especially for a knight. especially in this game where the dice gods were definitely supporting him and not me. Ah, and he passed fifteen three plus field no or three plus invul saves in a row. That's pretty good with all my multi damage shots. So, but that therein lies the problem, the heart of the problem, which is I made the mistake of being so focused on this knight, which he has to declare at the beginning of the phase that it has this buff on it, that I could have just lured him down this corridor. He has to call that he's giving it the plus one, and then jokes on him, all my stuff jumps away and just goes scoots for the honor Just because they move so quickly. Like, there's, it, it was to a point where there's literally no way he could logically catch me and I didn't use my mobility at all, and mm -hmm. I just let him box me into a corner and then just slowly kill me, and it did not. It was very, it was not pretty. It was, <laughs> it was real bad. I lost real bad. It was real bad. It tough was game. real bad. That Don't was a tough fight game. a knight in close combat. My soul was leaving me that game. It was, <laughs> uh, it was, it was real I'm bad. I'm to the spectral plane. Yeah, it was, it was real bad, and that was... I, I once we like discussed it because he's a great guy and we we do a lot of like uh competitive planning we talk tactics a lot and he and I were talking about it afterwards and I was like wow that was really stupid that was really stupid I also didn't read the stratagems close enough in Tau and didn't realize that the uh you can treat a uh battle suit I thought it was a riptide battle suit at full capacity applies to the Avaro. You mean give him the stimulant injectors? Which give it the stim injectors, mm, which means that essentially that good stuff. if the Yavar is not dead, it's always at full capacity. Yeah. And I didn't use it and it was real stupid. And yeah, that's my story and uh <laughs> we're gonna move on. Alright. But hey, lessons learned, right? Lessons learned. And Yavara, my goodness. Um so Jay, yeah? uh you ran into Moving some, on to the oh some 
dark I forces. I ran into some dark forces for sure. <laughs> and I gotta say, I am very happy how I lost this game <laughs> because it couldn't be more fluffy that after a, a good series of, I will say, unwarranted and... Your longest win streak? My longest win streak I think I've ever had for a while... And uh, I believe unearned because some sort of dark forces must have been at work. And I believe it was Vex because he was setting me up for the ultimate fall. He was ready to humble you. Because fluff wise, my friends, it was great (laughs) that my big loss after a while was to the Drukari. Yeah. And my goodness, our Drukari freaking back, baby. (laughs) They are competitive to the nth degree. They're so good. I mean, Drukari to me have kind of redefined what you can expect from a codex, and they can also basically play any army type they want. I would say, as far as the design of a codex is concerned, they probably have the most tactical flexibility. Yeah, it's it's crazy. Like you can literally, if you want to take a durable army, go Coven's. If you want to take a all in your face swarming, hitting you with a million attacks and bogging you down, witch cults, witches. If you want to write like a good, nice down the line army, Cabals are great. Well, I mean, even just you could say Cabals if you want, if you favor more the shooting phase, then Cabals is for you. Oh like. yeah, like and also you can just take all three and you have a really balanced and strong army yes so the opponent i went against he took cabals and homunculus covens and i think in a lot of the things that i've taken a look at with drukari i've looked a lot at the witches at the cabals but not so much the covens and i don't know why because my goodness is homunculus covens pretty darn strong they're a little hard to dislodge I mean, this guy was rocking. I don't know what the name of the obsession is. And by the way, obsessions are their version of craft worlds, chapter tactics, things like that. Uh, he was rocking the one that gives them plus one invul, right? Yes. I don't know what the name of it is, but it gives all of the coven guys plus one invul, which when everyone's rocking four up invuls on like four wound, seven wound models. With a six up feel no pain. With six up feel no pain, which is going to be a very important part of this story. They are so hard to deal with. Like, he had eight grotesques, four wounds apiece. Holy crap, are those things hard to kill. But even racks are, like, freaking difficult to deal with. Well, I mean, you're making them zench demons, essentially, yeah. at that point. So it's With the feel no pain. With the feel no pain. <laughs> and they're really, really good. And then he was he had some grotesques. He had three Talos pain engines, Yep. which we'll get to them, because they are a big part of this seize, as well as a couple racks. But he had some Ravagers. He had some Raiders with Cabal guys inside. The I Ravagers be- have the Dark Light. Yeah, or, I uh, believe he he also had a few witch stuff. He had some Reavers. He and, did. He had and Lilith. Um, he had Lilith. He had Urian as well. Like he had some good like named characters and one Archon. So he had the uh, he got to do the Warlord stratagem. If you haven't heard as well, the Trifecta, which is a really cool stratagem, where for one CP they can basically get two more Warlord traits. Yep, they favor you, multiple detachments. You can give a Warlord trait for each one. Yeah. And it's incredible. So he gave Lilith one, he gave Urin Rakarth one, and he gave his, and his Archon already had one, yeah. which is like the really good, anytime anybody spends a CP, you roll a die and on a six plus, you get one back. It's basically yep. like, oh, Autark, you thought you could do something cool? What about we do it for everything in your face? Man, Drukari, they took, I got to say this, Drukari, they got almost all of the great Eldar stratagems. Pretty much they got all the ones they could use. The ones they didn't really get are all Psyker based. I thought about it. All the ones they didn't really get are the Farseer and, like, oh, Psyker yeah. buffs. I mean, they are Eldar. They are Eldar. After all. But, and, I mean, they also got some incredible stratagems on top. And now we want to talk about it. The stratagem Agents of Vect is, holy crap, is that? Now, we've talked already a lot in this episode about a lot of meta and game-changing things that have come from GW yep. recently with the big FAQ. But Agents of Vect, even before this was one of the ones that, like, we looked at that and we were like, I think this is going to change the landscape of the game, especially competitively, quite a bit. Yeah, I mean, armies that rely so solely on a single stratagem occurring in a turn to then suddenly just nope card it is very powerful. It's really good. And, I mean, the fact that you can roll a six, and if you don't know how the stratagem works, I'm sure you do at this point, but just to recap. It's three CP. Three CP, the easiest and fastest thing I would ever spend 3 CP on is this stratagem. Uh, one, it fails. One, it fails, but you'll just command point to reroll it. Two to five, it cancels the stratagem, but they get the CP back. Yep, but on a six, 
they spend the CP and you still cancel their stratagem they just tried to use. Yeah. It is incredibly good. And I mean, it was used against me in this game to great effect. Um, but that still wasn't my C's. So I'll get to it. So I was running my same list that I'd been running in previous tournaments. I mean, if it isn't you're, broke, don't you're, fix it. You're 160 point now high list. My 160 point now <laughs> over the line list, which has been completely shattered. Um, so I will get to retool in it. But basically, um, I was unprepared for Jukari. I'd read up on them, but I just really like until you get into it, until you experience Agents of Vect live <laughs> and in living color, like you are just going to get hit by it yeah well it's like playing an army for the first time it's just like the the inverse of playing against an army for the first time it's like playing against demons for the first time pretty much and boy oh boy did this list do well against mine and mostly because and this is my big series of the month it comes down to focusing i didn't know what was going to do what in this list and i was so unprepared for the army and really the seas is Get to know your opponents and get to know the top tier armies you're going to run up against at tournaments or in games with your friends. Get to know those lists. Get to know those codexes because the Talos Pain Engines, turn one, I, I took out all of his grotesques. I focused everything on him, which I think was good in the long run. But Maybe. turn two, he flew up his Talos Pain Engines, and for whatever reason, my Autark was like, Men, everyone shoot at those things. And. In this turn that I positioned and focused everything on his Talos Pain Engines, which really, truly, I should have focused on other things in his army, especially because I was attacking things that weren't getting me points to win the game. Yes. You know, a thing that I've done in the past that I thought I got away from. Apparently not. Nope. I saw red, and I just attacked the Talos Pain Engines. Murderous bloodlust. And this turn, all of my psychic powers failed to go off. All of them fell. My doom, which I need to hurt something with T7 my guide for things that I need to shoot it well with, my jinx to remove that four-up invul. This Talos Pain Engine unit, which was three of them, it's three T7, four-plus invul, six-up feel no pain, walking tanks were basically eating all of my firepower when, on the board, which was going to get me points, his untouched Ravagers were flying around blowing up my wave serpents. Turns out, you know, Ravagers with dark light. good. Ouch. God, that D6 damage on, on blasters. My God. Yeah. So good, and it's everywhere now. Yep. Holy crap. And the Reavers I should have targeted, which were tar pitting units and attacking units. Lilith, who, holy crap, she didn't kill much, but she did one very key thing. She tied up my Wraith Guard. Forever. Forever. Because my Wraith Guard, every time I try to leave, witches have this clever little trick where they have this roll-off with you to see if you can actually leave the combat with them. Yep. And this is so powerful we talked about in our slanesh episode how powerful it is to hold somebody so they can't fall back and it is potent yep. where my wraith guard want to fall back because they can actually fall back and still shoot he they tied have, them up and they, they fly without fly fly without fly he tied them up they couldn't leave and shoot his ravagers which were busy just eliminating everything else in my army yep so that coupled with the fact that my biggest mistake was not focusing on those tanks, but focusing on these gosh darn Talos pain engines, I wasted rounds of fire, didn't protect myself well enough, and his army just ran over mine. Now, it still ended up being a close game, but man, Drukari are back in a big, big way. Well, it's funny because they're just, they're an army that's so pendulum based that they were, you know, they were an army that wasn't updated for 15 plus years. Yep. And then all of a sudden they got an update in fifth edition and they were awesome. They had a really fluffy codex. They were very powerful. And then all of a sudden, like all of their characters went away and they got super nerfed in sixth and seventh edition. It was like, what the hell happened? And now it's the complete inverse again, where suddenly they have all their toys back. Oh my God. They have their stratagems are probably now because they're getting the best of Eldar and agents of Vect. I will flat out say they have the best strategy in this game. Absolutely. I mean, Agents of Vect alone would have put it over the top, but they got all the good it's ones from Eldar. Strong. They've got some other really nasty ones too. Like, they are rocking incredible stuff. Now, they still don't have a Vect model. They don't have a Vect maybe model. Maybe down the line. Listen, I think we all know that GW is going to tee up a pretty rad Vect release. I mean, I, I will Babe Ruth style finger to the sky in 20, at the end of 2018 and especially 2019 and going forward when we have our codexes and we're getting all these narrative releases, I think we're going to be getting a lot of like Age of Sigmar style 
big model releases. It would be very cool if Dark Eldar just got a huge character release and all of the the they five characters back. they lost now have models. That would be great. So any Drakari fans out there or people interested in, like, check it out because, man, is Jay it got good. his butt whooped. I got my butt whooped. <laughs> and it couldn't have been better from my old Dark kin family across the way in this wonderful uh, webway um now i'm just waiting for my other friends to come back soon the uh clown the, town the clown town will be coming back in force and i'm very excited to see if they have any interesting stratagems now i'm not saying every army needs an agents of vect stratagem but it'd be pretty darn fluffy if harlequin's got something very kegarock laughing god style very like an eldar player to just want everything yeah i know right that's right yeah Yeah. isn't that look my army just got hit all right i got a lot of point increases (laughs) and i'm feeling really woozy um but anyways guys uh that was my season of the month and uh that was our season of the month and that'll take us into our main segment the brown library Well, uh, that oh, that felt real felt, weird. That transition felt really strange. It feels like something has. It's like we swapped bodies, swapped places. Hold on a second. But Jay, it it turns out you've done research. I have. I know. <laughs> usually, you are our number one list researcher here in the Brown Library. Um, but uh, yeah, I I I cracked open books and you, I wait. You can read. I, I know, right? I'm also surprised. Uh, they just the, the words just started making sense, and um, and and yeah. I mean, I should I, we be worried though that the books you were reading were in fact Necron tier books? Yeah, I mean, look, it was a little weird. I'll I'll admit, but uh, I gotta say, I'm pretty excited about it. And if people don't know, typically in our Brown Library segments, we kind of build out a fun list. Um, and yeah. uh, this month, I built out a list. And uh, I'm ready to share it with all of you now, because get ready for the ultimate bromance of all time and all millennia. I mean, uh, we could, it's more than millennia. Millions yeah. of years. Millions and millions of millennia. <laughs> because I'm here to tell you the tale of Nemesar Zandrek and Vargard Oberon. Because we are talking about Necrons! The best of friends. You know, that codex that came out that everybody was like, hey, Necrons. Then it was like, Drukari, Agents of X Stratagem. And it was like, oh, my God. And then it was like, big FAQ. It was like, oh, my God. It's part of the the, the, you know, the whole, there's so much releasing there's all at so once. There's so much <laughs> happening that we almost passed by the fact that the robots got a new codex. And it's pretty rad. And it's pretty good. And I think... Uh, it's just been. I think it's just the whole Drukari of it all that it got kind of quickly passed by. Well, it's just it's always flavor a flavor of the month. I mean, even Tau has been left by the wayside because there's just too much happening all at once. But even so, they've kind of gotten still like a lot of the the spotlight because of the commander thing that came up. But I feel like they yeah, got this more salt. Yeah, I know. Than than there's a lot else. of salt <laughs> and a lot of articles written about the commander bit, and then Necrons came around and everybody was like. Yeah, looks pretty good. And then, like, just moved along. There wasn't anything, like, controversial. It was just like, yeah, all right, good. Go cool. on. Good codex. And it is a good codex. And I'm very excited to talk about this list because for a while, I've really loved Necrons. So, wait, hold on. I need to interrupt you. Oh, sure. It doesn't have Nemesar, Zendrick, or Vargard over on that. No, it doesn't have any of them there. <laughs> No. I just wanted to declare that they have a great bromance going on. So so Necron, uh, Necrons have always been a thing. I mean, Jay's had a Necron army essentially since Necrons released. And that was back in the days when Necrons were mindless robots controlled by the Catan and not the inverse of... And they used to phase out when yeah, they got down oh, to 25%. The, oh, phase Remember out. a classic phase out rule? For the, people who don't know... When Necrons got to, like, when they were got weak enough, your army would literally just leave you the would battlefield. You would auto-lose. You would auto-lose when you lost 75% of your army. Sorry, 75% of the Necron units in your yeah, army. Yeah, which didn't count Canoptic or vehicles. Or, I believe, like, the vehicles. <laughs> yeah. Which is a very weird way to balance that army. Yeah, it was very strange. But 
They are now into a place with their fluff with where instead, you know, the Necron tier is still very much around where they have dynasties and they're like royalty. Very much the fifth edition kind of uh, redo of the Necron Codex. They've enslaved the leftover shards of the Catan and... Which is pretty cool. Pretty cool. All their canoptic stuff is real rad of the, the robot uh, machines that they made, the insect bug things that essentially care for their tomb world. Yeah. And stuff. Um, but yeah, I mean, their new codex came out and it essentially just made them no longer just the army that survives shit. Yeah, pretty much. And they can do a lot of tricky stuff. And the reason why I wanted to talk about the Necrons today is for two reasons. One, I think they neither do because Necrons are cool and I want to talk about them. They just got a new codex. Second, though, with this big FAQ, it is almost a perfect narrative story, one might say, the perfect crafting of a millennia-long strategy that one great general, Nemesar Zandrak, who may or may not be insane, who may or may not be absolutely bug nuts crazy, (laughs) has finally enacted his great long strategy, which is all these armies out there, thanks to this big FAQ, and specifically the beta rule for tactical reserves, are feeling a lot more secure. They're like, you know, we're not going to get alpha struck in our in our deployment zone. We're going to have a little bit more time to feel things out. We don't need all these screens. Everything's going to be just fine. You mean that Necrons have some kind of shenanigans, which they obviously don't have. Oh, definitely to not, bypass Andrew. To bypass the reserve change? The reserve change. Because Zandrak was waiting, Andrew. <laughs> and now's the time to strike. So let's get into it. So... Let's talk about this list. So this list is not your typical Necron list, I think, uh, because it's just a smattering of a lot of crazy stuff. Honestly, I don't even know what a typical Necron list is anymore. True. I mean, like, typically I think you see a lot of Necron warriors, and there's some in here, but, like, it's not like a giant phalanx just walking up the field, which is still cool, by the way. It's just my style since I play very Eldari, very tricky very like what kind of bullshit shenanigans can i pull off with this yep, list sounds like jay it's pretty much what i was like now what kind of bullshit shenanigans can i pull <laughs> off with this list um and sure enough it lied with one absolutely bug nuts shenanigans general nemesar zandrak now to give you a little background in this character yes and to talk a little bit about the bromance that i hinted at nemesar zandrak and his kind of uh colleague i guess we'll say vargard obron are this incredible dynamic duo in the Necron Codex. Now, you may think that Vargard Oberon is just his glorified bodyguard. His glorified bodyguard. But he's and, oh so much more. And I've thought that forever until I found this book here in the Brown Library and I could somehow read for whatever reason. And basically... Nanites. Nanites. Yes. Oh, is that what these bugs are under my skin? Oh, they came out of the book. That made so much sense now. I could be dying. Now, before I die, let's talk about this list. Because basically, the history goes... Nemesar Zandrek woke up from Necron sleep as all the Necron tomb worlds were waking up to, you know, obviously take back the universe as they rightfully deserve. Oh, God, they're getting into my brain. Um, basically, he, when he woke up, much like a lot of Necrons, struggled with this kind of this sleep. Uh, I, I don't want to call it like a virus, but basically, since these Necrons slept for so long... As they were waking back up, not a lot of them woke up the exact same way they went in. Not all of his faculties were there. And unfortunately for him, Nemesar Zandrak uh, still believes he's a human person. And by human, I mean Necron Tear. He still has flesh and organs. He is not a robot man. And the War of the Dynasties is still happening. And War of the Dynasties, this is pre-War in Heaven. This is when the Necrons were just fighting amongst themselves, when they all had flesh and blood. And he just believes he's just still in it. And I don't mean just like when he's around his buddies. When he's fighting orcs, he thinks he's fighting Necron tier. <laughs> when he's fighting Eldar, he thinks he's fighting Necron tier. For yes. whatever reason, tyrannids Tyran- Tyran- appear to him as giant Necron tier weird dudes. Yeah, I mean, like he's but, like, we're dodging around the, the the bush here. He's senile. He's a little he's, senile. He's a giant robot man that happens to be senile. But the great part of it is he is still the most tactical, incredible general that Imotech, the big old lord badass of the Necrons right now of the Sautech dynasty, which is the dynasty he belongs to. So does Vargard, and we'll talk about Sautech uh, for this particular list it's going to be the focus and uh Sautech and dynasties they are like the chapter tactics and craft worlds and obsessions of the necrons yes the Sautech, and we'll talk about their rule literally right now basically their special ability is anytime a 
vehicle or anything with the heavy weapon profile moves, it doesn't count as having the heavy weapon profile. It doesn't get the minus one for having a heavy weapon, yep. basically. And if you advance with rapid fire or heavy weapons, they turn into assault. So that's pretty darn good. Silly. Silly is what you'd call it. Pretty good. <laughs> It also gives them access to some pretty cool stratagems and rad characters like these guys, which we'll get to in a second. But back to my tale! So basically, Nemesar Zandrek is still this incredible general. He even has an ability we'll talk about called Counter Tactics, which is at the beginning of your opponent's turn, choose one enemy character within 12, so you gotta be close, of Nemesar Zandrek. Any aura abilities that character has cannot be used until the beginning of your opponent's next turn. Sorry, G-Man. No reroll hits and wounds in any of your shenanigans. Just completely shut down. Sorry, call. None of your crazy rerolls or anything. Like, just completely shuts down aura abilities, which is pretty good. Yeah. Now, previ- in previous editions, his ability essentially allowed him to take... Well, in the first iteration of it, it allowed him to take one of the universal special rules and just apply it to a unit for a turn. Which, my God, that would have been really strong in this edition. With Yeah, which then in the 6th and 7th edition iteration of it allowed him to essentially copy one of the abil- the universal special rules that an, an enemy character had within range of him. Which so, also would have been just bonkers. Also very edition. strong. So this one just, I mean, shut, auras are very important. And sh- being able to shut down any aura like that is very strong. Now, that's not like the secret sauce of what I'm going to talk about on this list, but it's still pretty cool. The other thing that's kind of like a reflection of how absolutely crazy he is, he has an ability called Transient Madness. <laughs> Roll a D3 at the beginning of your turn and consult the following table. It's random, which also kind of follows the fluff of him being crazy. Choose a friendly Sawtech infantry, so it's got to be Sawtech and infantry, unit within six of Nemesar Zandrak to gain the relevant ability until the beginning of your next turn. One, Avenge the Fallen! Add one to attacks characteristics of models in this unit. Two, Quell the Rebellion. Again, he thinks he's just back in the day. Improve the ballistic skill of models in this unit by one. Pretty good. The last one, Solar Mills. Charge! (laughs) Reroll failed charge rolls for this unit. I just love that it's Solar Mills question mark and then charge with an exclamation point. Um, He also has the classic My Will Be Done, which a lot of Overlords and Necrons have, which is basically you can add a one to advance. um, Charge rolls. Charge rolls and ballistic skill, skill. which was pretty good. Uh, It's very strong. But uh, basically, he's a, he's an all-around great overlord. He has a two-up save. Um, he has six wounds. He's got a four-plus invul, two-plus weapon skill, two-plus ballistic skill. Like, all around, like, pretty solid He's a dude. strong individual character. Yeah. Now, basically, let's talk about... Because really, the power of him comes from this dynamic duo. We've talked a little bit about Nemesar Zandrak. But what about Vargard Oberon? Again, we I always kind of thought he was kind of this dumb bodyguard that followed him around that was really good in close combat. And he is. He's incredible in close combat. He's got a war scythe. He's got an ability where literally if you kill him before he gets to strike, he still gets to strike. Yep. But there's a specific rule in here called Ghost Walk Mantle. Yep. Which really makes what this list is going to be called the Sawtech Shuffle. Yep. Really pop off. The Sawtech Shuffle is a special move that Nemesar Zandrek and... Vargard Oberon have been designing and crafting for millennia, waiting for this very FAQ to drop, to enact. And we'll talk about it in a second, but how Vargard Oberon's related to Nemesar Zandrek is he kind of was his bodyguard way back in the day, and then when they all turned into Necrons, these robots, he still served him, and he still serves him to this he's day. He's still sworn to protect him, but he's not only protecting his body, he's also protecting his mind. Because Vargard knows that they're not people back in the day anymore. He's kind of, it's really kind of, honestly, in this terrible horrifying universe it's really kind of a sweet relationship that this guy's like taking care of this crazy old man yeah he is he is quite literally his caretaker he yeah. understands that he is mad but he's sworn a, to protect him sworn to protect him and he's still a genius yeah. and the thing is Vargard Oberon isn't just like a dumb bodyguard he's actually a political genius where where Nemesar Zandrak is a tactical genius in the field, when any of these other Necron lords start to gain power and want to overtake Nemesar Zandrak, Vargard Oberon is very quick to suss them out and either challenge them in one-on-one combat, which, guess what, he wins, or just take them out silently. So Vargard Oberon is also a pretty crafty fellow himself. He's kind of like if Ned Stark from that old Data Slate Game of Thrones was also the spider, 
like from Game of Thrones. Yeah. He's like, he's got it all. Oh, and you're saying, and then you're saying that uh, the, the king, uh, King Robert is in fact Nemesar Zandrak. Pretty much. just basically I, drinking and like crazy all the time. And just crazy, but I guess tactical. I don't know if that guy was that tactical. He was, a, I mean, he was, a, a, they beat the fucking Targaryen. That's true. So maybe, look, that's a perfect, <laughs> it's a perfect mirror right there. If anybody's seen, I don't know, it's a very old data slate. Yeah. Game of Thrones, look it up. It's it might be in a right. history bank somewhere. <laughs> um, but basically, Vargard Oberon, and Nemesar Zandrak, one thing to point out is he's incredibly honorable. He actually is one of the only Necrons that, because he thinks he's back in the old day, follows all the old codes of ancient combat and ancient engagement. He will actually take prisoners, which, guess what? Not a lot of Necrons do that. They just eliminate stuff and delete them from the universe. Well, I mean, we should be clear here. Even though he takes the prisoners, then Vargard, uh, you know, eliminates them escaping. Yes. <laughs> uh, the other side of this is Vargard uh, does know what period they are in and will sometimes quietly remove those prisoners. They somehow were killed in their quote unquote escape. Um, but still, pretty cool, um, this guy. Now, let's talk about how this duo works. Well, it's also cool because you're not required to take them together. I mean, but if you take them together, it's very fluffy. Oh, yes. It is very fluffy. And cool. And we're taking them together. Because, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, this is the Sawtech Shuffle. And this is how you get it on over every other list out there. Now, how does one do the Sawtech Shuffle, all of you are asking in unison? Well, I will tell you. I will feed you, baby birds. Because <laughs> the Sawtech Shuffle, to do it correctly, requires four ingredients. We've got Nemesar Zandrek, we've got Vargard Oberon, so we've got half of it. What's the other half, you ask? Well, you're going to need one willing other HQ character. For this example, for this list, I've picked a Cryptek, because Cryptek's are awesome and have a lot of value here. Cryptex are basically, think of them kind of like the sorcerers for Necrons, because Necrons don't really have magic. You, Yeah, they're the they're the masters of technology. Yeah. They're engineers, essentially. Their technology is so incredible, like beyond every other race, by the way. like, yes. And this isn't just like bias. This is like in the canon. Their, their technology is beyond Eldar. It's beyond, you know, Adeptus Mechanicus. It's so beyond everyone that it looks like magic. Yes. Which is why these Cryptex are basically like, you know, technology sorcerers they're like this other old data slate like, like doctor who or like i mean you could call them like another data slate like the asgard in the marvel universe yes, because the marvel universe. well they're still around where you know oh. that race has been yet to be discovered it's, oh, it's right, coming right. out this fall sorry right. <laughs> um so yeah like them essentially where they're sorry the space wolves i mean you mean yeah. the space wolves the space wolves yes um, where their technology has essentially gone so far that they they treat it like sorcery and exactly. that's and that's what this is like where it's like i mean I guess the Imperium sort of does that as well, believing that all the machines have spirits and stuff. But this is technology that it's even unfathomable to many of the advanced races. Oh, yeah. Now, this Cryptek is going to be armed with a chrononometron. Listen, it's Necron technology. I can't pronounce it correctly. But basically, it's supposed to, like, slow down time yes. so that things can dodge bullets. And basically, it gives any unit within three inches a five-up invul save, which is incredible. Yep. And Cryptex also have, within three inches of them, any unit also adds one to the reanimation protocol. So they are great buffing units. Yep. Now, you give this Cryptek a Veil of Darkness. A Veil of Darkness is pretty cool. It basically... At the end of a movement phase, it allows the wearer of the Veil of Darkness to instantly teleport anywhere else on the board. Basically redeploy, I guess you could say. And they can also take one Sawtech infantry unit with them. Or, sorry, a Dynasty unit with them. Which a, this is Sawtech. So. Which is Sawtech. But Dynasty infantry. I gotta stress that it is infantry. Can basically redeploy another infantry unit with them. Now, the last bit of the Sawtech shuffle is a big old unit of flayed ones, which is a personal favorite of us on this podcast. Love them flayed ones. And it is 20 flayed ones because you gotta have that big old blob. Because 20 flayed ones, by the way, flayed ones are incredible. They are T4, they're weapon skill 3, but they have 3 attacks apiece. And they rerolled a wound. And they rerolled a wound. Ouch. They are bonkers. So that's right, 20 flayed ones, that's 60 attacks in close combat. Yep, that hit on threes and reroll. And there are one. stratagems in this game that you can buff plus one to hits and with how things go down, you have also stratagems in here that up their strength by one, so they strength wait. five. Hold on, hold on. I think I'm I think I'm picking up what you're putting down mm, here. You figuring out that shuffle? Because I, I get this now. You have Oberon's Ghost Walk Mantle, which I'm assuming is like Ooh. a... Kind of like a veil of darkness. Veil of you darkness? see 
The ghost walk mantle is interesting technology because Vargard Oberon has had to defend this crazy old man for a very long time. Wherever he may be. Wherever he may be, because he wanders off, I'm sure. And he's like, God, where is he now? He's probably almost getting assassinated. Funny stuff about Nemesar Zandrak, we won't get into it, but the dude gets attacked so often, he literally has created death traps in his house. Anyways, <laughs> um, what this ghost mantle does, it essentially allows him to teleport right to where Nemesar Zandrak is so he can defend him and hopefully kill somebody who's attacking him. It basically works like a veil of darkness that's triggered right to Nemesar Zandrak. He has a permanent GPS beacon on the senile old man so that he can locate him when he gets confused and walks six miles to the next town. Exactly. <laughs> but it's a little bit unique. One, it's not a once per game. The veil of darkness is a once per game use. The yeah. ghost mantle can be used any number of times. It also is a little different which is what makes the shuffle work. Mm. Let me read it off to you. Ghostwalk Mantle. At the end of any of your movement phases, you can remove Vargard Obron and a friendly Sawtek infantry unit within six inches of Vargard Obron, again, Sawtek infantry, just like we read for Veil of Darkness, from the battlefield and set them up so that all models are within six inches of Nemesar Zandrek and more than one from enemy models. Now that last sentence is really Wait, wait, really wait. important. Hold on, hold on. I think I'm picking up here. Mm. This may be... Homing beacon territory we're oh, talking about here. It's Necron homing beacon territory, my friend, because this is how the Sawtech shuffle works. Basically, you've got your three HQ characters, and you can hide them in a little building if you're not going turn one. And now, with reserves being what they are, you don't have to worry about a unit coming in and you know quick timing it and and warp timing it right up to your face and smashing you while you're hiding in a building, or put them in a, you know, put them in a vehicle, whatever you want to do. Basically, they're protected, all three of them. You might be asking, where are the flayed ones? Well, I'll tell you. The flayed ones are in a little pocket dimension, because you can actually deploy them in a pocket dimension turn one, so you don't have to worry about a opponent alpha striking the crap out of your very sensitive and very weak, I don't want to say weak, but... Very fragile flayed ones, because they are only T4 with one wound, even though they have reanimation And protocols. a four plus save. And a four plus save. Yeah. Now, how it works is this. Again, the armies now are basically thinking, okay, I can't get deep struck or charge my turn one because things can't come into my deployment zone. I'm safe. Well, how the new FAQ works is you cannot deploy a unit into another person's deployment zone. You can't, sorry, you can't deploy a unit outside of your own deployment zone turn one. Well, this is how the craftiness works. Your cryptic has the Veil of Darkness. So at the end of the movement phase is when all this happens. And you can choose how things happen in order of operation at the end of the movement phase. First thing, cryptic grabs Nemesar Zandrek by the collar and says, Buddy, we're going for a ride. He Veil of Darknesses across the board nine inches away from your opponent because Veil of Darkness has a limitation. You cannot be closer than nine inches, just like normal Deep Strike is. Yep. Then, out of the terrible dimension portal comes your flayed ones, and they land in your deployment zone, per the FAQ. They land right next to Vargard Oberon. Vargard Oberon goes, you ready to do this, buddy? The flayed ones say some weird thing because they're crazy. They high-five him, and then he uses the ghost walk mantle to teleport himself and the flayed ones next to Nemesar Zandrek and the Cryptek. Most importantly, and I'll read this again for everyone, the end of ghost walk mantle says... Vargard Oberon from the battlefield and set them up so that all models are within six inches of Nemesar Zandrek and more than one inch from enemy models. So, so Andrew, how close can you get 20, with all those flayed 20 ones? 20 flayed ones just beyond three inches? That's right, With folks. a rerollable charge? With the Saw Tech Shuffle, you can yeah. get 20 flayed ones within three inches of anything oh and then uh because they're an infantry unit uh -huh. you can give them my will be done uh-huh so then they come in and they're you know three inches away yep and you can boost them with stratagems make their strength five you can depending on what hits like if you have vargard oberon run in two by the way he's three inches away as well oh yeah so he a, can charge turn he's one a beast in combat you can charge him in and if he does damage first and does a wound first in close combat before they do you can spend a stratagem and now all of them hit on twos instead of threes in their close combat that's good and on top of all this kind of stuff, you have them, when they charge, a couple guys close enough to that cryptic, so now they have a plus one to their reanimation, because they're going to get shot a bunch. They also have a five-up in vol against shooting. Yep. And this, my friends, is the Sawtech shuffle. When everybody thought it was safe to hang out in their deployment zone, Nemesar Zandrek came in with a pretty nasty three-inch, 20-flayed one charge. 
The other thing to keep in mind about this is you can do Ghost Walk Mantle every turn. So if your Flayed Ones are stuck in on combat, or if you just want to be the first one to attack, you can re-teleport Oberon and the Flayed Ones out of combat again at the beginning of... Just as long as they're near Nemesar's Andrek. Yeah, and they just land near him again and can charge again something else. They have basically this kind of redeploy super fallback ability with an ability to charge again with Ghostwalk Mantle. It is pretty good. So guys, that is how you can basically do this crazy workaround that's called the Sawtex Shuffle. And I imagine we're going to see this because it to me, is a pretty big disruption and a pretty big counter meta to what people are now going to be expecting with this big FAQ. And also, if you didn't think that was crazy enough or annoying enough, here's the rest of the list, because that's only about 755 points. You can do that pretty cheaply. Everything else, though, just for funsies. Again, this is kind of layering on, because Nemesar Zandrek is crazy, but he's a great tactician, that you're kind of layering on the craziness, the escalation of this. Yeah, well, I mean, he he's still a competent general. Yeah. He may not have all his faculties, yeah. but he knows what he's doing. Wait, are you describing me? Are you describing Nemesar Zandrek? Moving on. God damn it. <laughs> um, all right, so, but really what happens before all of this, because really what you're doing is you're, you're setting them up. You're, you're hitting them blow after blow. The rest of the list is a Tesseract Vault, is a Catan Shard of the Deceiver, Oh, and is 20 Necron Warriors in one unit and two Necron Immortals, each with eight-man units. Now, Necron Immortals are great. They're they're kind of good backfield to, to grab objectives, but the real extra fun comes with the Catan Shard of the Deceiver. So if you don't know this, they've got an ability where at the beginning of the game, but before the first turn begins, so kind of around when you do infiltrating, they can roll a D3. And both the Deceiver and up to D3 other units can redeploy and this is, again, important. Redeploy, not deep strike, units that are on the board 12 inches away up to anywhere on the board, but as long as they're 12 inches away from the enemy. So you can, with a good roll, redeploy both the Deceiver, the Tesseract Vault, and the Necron Warrior unit 12 inches away from yeah, your opponent. Yeah, it's, it's, it's the, the, the Tesseract Vault is just like... I mean, and even with a bad roll, you're still guaranteed to get the Tesseract Vault. So how this list works is this. You basically, and by the way, how it works is the, uh, the Tesseract Vault is the Lord of War uh, detachment, the single Lord of War detachment. And the only other detachment in here is one battalion, which has everything else, yes. which you can fit in. Um, it has the three troop minimum with two units of immortals and one unit of big Necron warriors. So this is the layering. This is, this is the fear. This is the madness that you're delivering with this list is first you drop the Deceiver and a Tesseract Vault and maybe a Necron warrior unit of 20 guys right next to the enemy lines. And if you're going first, this is even more punishing. Like, if you're going first, like, this combo can almost cripple an army in turn one. Well, essentially, it's just bypassing a change to the restriction of reserves. Yeah. Basically, the Tesseract Vault and the Deceiver, two Catans, which have incredibly powerful mortal wound dealing potential, yes. can hit you hard turn one. Star God Guns. Star God Guns out the wazoo, which we haven't even gotten to. We don't have time in this episode, but look them up. The mortal wound capacity power is incredible, especially coming from a Tesseract Vault. Also, 20 warriors ain't nothing. Within 12-inch range, guess what? You're rapid firing. That's 40 shots. Yep. And before they teleport and do all this stuff, like you can do, you can buff them in so many ways. Anyways, then when it's your turn, if you're going first, then you do the other bit where you drop the flayed ones in. Now you're hitting them with 20 warriors, a Tesseract Vault, a Deceiver, 20 flayed ones, Vargard Oberon, and Nemesar Zandrak is just laughing and you have the little cryptech right next to both the flayed ones and the warriors so both units either way is getting plus one to their reanimation protocols and five of invuls that my friends is the sawtech shuffle and that is the madness of nemesar zandrak yeah well i mean having 85 percent of an army 12 inches away from you minimum it's pro it can cause problems yeah it certainly can. It's problematic. And look, it accommodates everything. You start with all this power level on the board. You got it all there on your side, so you're not you're not having everything. The only thing that's deep striking, the only, the only thing that's deep striking is those played ones, you know? So so basically, you're just taking the role that the Plague Burst Crawler guy yes. did of saying yes. that 
is, I this am the, just, is this the insanity of Nemesar Zendrick that this needs to be changed? Is I that mean, what's listen, happening? What I'm doing is I'm taking all the goodwill we generated at the beginning of this episode <laughs> and I'm burning it all. Just here, throwing it out back, the door. Just throwing it all out the door. We were like, balance is great. But now my madness has taken over. These bugs have gotten deep into my system, Andrew. And you can create a pretty mean Alpha Strike list with Necrons, which, again, nobody noticed with all the Drakari stuff. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, the Sawtech Shuffle is a real move, guys. And it's uh, it's out there. And Nemesar Zandrek has been waiting to enact this, uh, this move for quite a while. And, uh, sorry... <laughs> So if you see flayed ones, I mean that's the honor of Nemesar Zendrick is that he does this to the enemy while he's just screaming at the top of his lungs. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. But and now you can rejoin the kingdom. You know, because he's insane. Yeah, he just just wants it, the, the order to be there. Honor amongst enemies. Honor <laughs> amongst enemies. And so everybody, that was episode 46 of Roll to Seas. We'll be posting a new episode of this segment every last Wednesday of the month with episodes of Dark Heresy every first and second Wednesday. And, of course, we know 40K Arena has been absent for a little while. Yes. We've been kind of retooling what we want as our, our next part of the uh, the monthly lineup. And we're happy to announce that we're going to very soon release a second episode of Roll to Seas each month with a focus on... Fluff and possible other things. Possible other things. Still mysterious, but give you guys a little bit more insight into some of that fun lore out there. But anyways, as always, you can email us any questions at RollToSeas at gmail.com. Of course, you can always follow us on Twitter and Instagram for tournament and model picks at Partial Arc. Thanks for listening, and see you next month! It's craziness. It's craziness.